Do you know what to bring to the table when applying for a job to work within the data industry? Well, that's what this week's episode is all about as we sit down and talk to a CEO of a tech company about what it is that they're looking for when it comes to employing new people. Hello there, welcome to this week's episode of The Data Radio Show. In this episode, I'm going to sit down and have a chat to Christoph Weinzerit. Christoph's actually the CEO of Scalefree, based out of Germany. They do a whole bunch of different data builds and data work around Europe, and they have a really interestingly diverse workforce. Some people are in the company permanently, some are contractors or freelancers who work with the company on specific projects, which means that when it comes to hiring people, well, it's different for each particular role. So I have a chat to him about what he's looking for, what that process involves, and how you can stand out from the crowd a little bit when it comes to those application processes. And maybe a few of the pitfalls to avoid while you're in there as well. So let's jump over, have a chat to Christoph, and hopefully you get something out of this one that's going to help you further your career along working as a data professional. Right, Christoph Weinzer, thank you very much for joining me for this week's episode. I'm really keen to have a chat to you about hiring people, especially for people who might be just getting into the data field, who are sort of looking at tips and steps to get the sort of all important job out there to start their working career. Uh, and I thought, you're CEO of a company, you do a whole bunch of work with a whole bunch of people from university all the way through to people who have been in the industry for a while. Um, you work with one of the biggest names in, in data vault ever. So you'd have a really good understanding of what it is that people coming into the industry can bring and maybe some hints and tips for them as well on what they could do to stand out or expand on their knowledge base just to basically get a foot in the door. Um, so I thank you very much for joining me. I very much appreciate it. Yes, I'm happy to be here. Uh, interviews are always an important topic. I think, I don't know, last year I must have done like 80 interviews, something like that. So it's not, you know, not, not doing that all day, obviously, um, mm -hmm. but a lot. And it's a huge subject for us as well, like, because it's always on both sides, right? On the one side, what can you do to be hired and as a company? What can you do to um, separate people, like to really find the best fits for your company? It's a tough task as well. So that was something we focused a lot on in the past um, to really find the people who fit best to scale free, right? Uh, so we mm -hmm. really like the topic. Um, and would love to give some tips to everyone out there um, to help them a bit along the way. Fantastic. So I guess the first question for you then is that when, you, when you're looking to hire someone or take on somebody for a freelance or contractor role, what skills do you see as being the most important for you and why is that? Mm -hmm. All right. So freelancers, so we, we hire mostly freelancers, yes, for helping us in projects, right? But they you know, it, it's really tough to trust freelancers because you usually don't know them and they go directly into a project. So it's much different than from an internal um, person. Um, so the first thing, when do we hire? We do uh, hire freelancers from time to time. In general, I would say a lot. Um, but it's in the IT business, it's normal because you always have some gaps in the project team for one specific tool or something like that where you need a freelancer to fit in the gap. Um, on a seniority, there's one person missing in which one level and you don't have them on the bench so you talk to someone outside the company um, so this is when we come back to freelancers and we work with a selected few over the years i would say um because after you know who to trust you come back to them so nowadays it would always be the first choice is going to the freelancers you already have done projects with in the past so you know everything is fine um but obviously we look for new ones from time to time as well and there we focus mostly, like, do they have the gap? They, they need to fill the gap, right? So we can ask really specific yeah. technical questions. Can they do that, right? And um, also, um, they have to be in our training before. So we have to know that they have the same terminology. They have the same understanding of data world, because usually it has something to do with data world. And, um, and then we talk to them. Usually, we met them already at events, so we talk for a while. So we have a good feeling personally as well and then reach out to them and then it must fit timely for them as well and if it does you go forward so it's much more straightforward than with hiring someone from a company as an employee and um, do you find when you're looking through these applicants that a, a formal education background brings something different to the table than somebody who's might be self-taught 
do you find are there different strengths and yeah. weaknesses between them or that seem to be uniform between them yes <laughs> i actually do it's a really good question um because i found it out for myself like why it's different what is it coming from for a specific area and then i found out okay those guys are more self-taught and those are maybe more formal background or they focus more on the formal background so the big difference is the why and how right so if you have a good formal background, you usually learn a lot about theory and you learn a lot about why are we doing this? What are methodologies to reach a goal? So it's, you know, it's more theory in the why and you have a deep understanding of how software, for example, works or development should work, how a product should work, etc. cetera. Um, but you may be missing a lot of hows. So you don't, you know what to do basically, but you don't know how to do it, right? Um, <laughs> So then comes the self-taught people who know mostly a lot of hows. So they already know a lot of technologies or they're really specific, specific, specific in one technology and they're really good at it. Um, but they often miss the why. So they can do it, but they don't think about it too much. So it's just start doing and then they maybe screw up big time somewhere else. So it's, it's always re really, really different depending where the people are coming from. So, um, I would say a good applicant always has both, right? So I always focus on that, that on the academic career as well. And I really under, try to ask a lot of questions if they understand the why is it like that, right? Think about it a bit. And um, that mostly comes good from that perspective. It's really good if they come from that perspective. But if you don't have any self-taught and no side projects, nothing at all, and they only have a form of background, then they miss all the house. That's a problem as well, right? So it always needs needs to be a mix, I would say. But uh, one thing I hear a lot for young people is that formal education is, you know, it's just that you have to do it and then you have your degree and you can start working. And it's a big mistake, right? Because you learn a lot of good things in university. You may don't see it that way because usually young people want to know how, but they don't learn really how. They learn mm -hmm. more about the why, so they're pissed about that and they don't really listen. Um, but it's a really, really good foundation, right? That you can get at good schools, right? Um, so pay attention at school kids. <laughs> yeah. one, one of the things I found when I was going to university, because I studied media production, yeah. um, was the number of people I went to university with who had it in their heads that they would walk out of that course and go yeah. on to direct some kind of big feature film. Is there an equivalent in the data industry? Uh, I would say less, to be honest, because there's so much technology mm -hmm. out there and people are usually more shy if they work in IT. So you don't, don't have it that much. You have that kind of people as well. But usually it's less, I would say. So they're more shy. They know, they know a lot that they don't know yet, right? So they mm -hmm. know all the technologies they have no idea about yet. So they're more keen to learn usually, but they don't think they can do it all in the beginning. So that I have good experiences in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's just media people. We get a little bit full of ourselves sometimes. It's yeah, it comes be. with the job. <laughs> yeah, comes with the job. Yeah, um, what sort of skills or knowledge areas then do you feel that people need to have if they're working in the data industry? Um, I mean, uh, it depends where they work in data. If if I talk about BI, mm -hmm. um, I would say. What people miss sometimes is that it's a lot of logic, right? So it's mostly logic. So you need a lot of logical thinking. If you're good in math, it's a big plus, even if you don't use the math, but the thinking behind it is really helpful. Um, because you have to model data, et cetera. It's always logic. You learn some basic concepts, it's not that much, but then how to implement it, it's a lot of logic. And then you talk to business users and they have some idea and you really have to while you talk, right, you have to really understand what they actually mean in terms of data terms and translate it live and give it back, give good feedback back. So um, there's a lot, I think, of thinking involved within, there's a lot of thought process all the time, right? So if you're good mm -hmm. with numbers and good with logical processes, then you're going to be good in BI, I think, um, especially in the area where we work, right? Um, so that helps. Um, we also have consultancy. So if you want to be a consultant, that's different, obviously, than working internally somewhere. So as a consultant, you would always need good social skills because you need to be able to talk to a lot of different persons and new persons all the time. 
um, you have to be sympathetic, right? You have to understand them, right? Be professional and all that, all, all that stuff, right? That's not just skill, but also how you translate it, right? And um, the last one in consulting is there's a lot of new things all the time, right? So you have to be a really, really quick learner. So that if you're good at that, like at uni, if you, this is actually why I look at grades as well. Like people always ask mm -hmm. me, like, do you look at grades? And they're kind of, you know, pissed if I say yes, because <laughs> like, ah, but you know, it, it, grades are not really, if you can do it or not, like, yeah, yeah, I know that's not the point, but the point is if you have a really difficult university and if you're good at grades, I know that you are able to put in a lot of new information in your head and put it on paper, right? Um, that's a skill that you can use in a consulting because often there's a new technology and you have, let's say, two weeks to learn it, right? And you have to be good at it. So you have to do a lot of these situations where, for learn, learn, where you have to learn a lot in a short period of time. So that should be good. Social skills should be there and logical thinking should be there. And then you should be good for that. And then the technical skills that really depends on which level you want to start, etc. Mm -hmm. So there it really, really depends what you want to do, right? But obviously, obviously, you should have some technical skills in the area where you want to work in. On the flip side of that, then, are there any red flags that jump out for you if you see it on an application or see it on somebody's resume that you just automatically go, no, this person's not going to work in this situation? I mean, red flags. I mean, if, if your CV looks absolutely horrible, like horrible, with spelling mistakes all over the place, that would be like a no, mm -hmm. yes. Um, in general, like I, I don't like people who show off too much, but you know that varies much in cultures. So, you know, there, there's cultures where they have learned that they have to put in the CV the very, very, very best they are, right? Um, and they, you know, extensively over um, estimate their skill in the CV. And then there's culture was mm -hmm. exactly the opposite. So it's really tough to understand there. So I don't do any um, red flagging here anymore. I did in the beginning because as a German, like, okay, that's a bit too much, but okay, that person of culture where that's normal, so it's fine. Um, so I don't do that anymore, but I don't really red flags. Not really, it's always a combination of things, to be honest, right? So I don't really have these red flags where I'm looking for, except it's a horrible CV or a horrible application mm -hmm. letter. Um, but that's, that would be it. See, I've done hiring many times in the past and I used to work with a, an employment company here and the number, like as soon as you see a spelling mistake, that's really obviously bad to me, yeah. that's just a warning sign. You know, they, the applicant hasn't put in the effort to actually get the little things right to try and impress people. It's yeah, always, exactly. So yeah. It, that's a big issue. But if it's one, it's okay, to be honest. It's, sometimes we have that we, because mostly it's English and I know it's not the first language. So it's, you know, mm -hmm. we, we are not that tough on CVs, to be honest. It's more like we have the first interview and the second and the first one. And they really learn, you know, the HR talks to the people and recruiting talks to the people. And um, the feedback there is more important than the CV itself. Um, so yeah, maybe other red flags. I don't know like if, if it's a huge, you know, okay, one red flag I would say is if it's too many company changes. So that's, you know, we hire long-term usually. People here stay for long a long time at Scarefree and it's, you know, and there's a lot they have to learn. So they, they take years and then they get better and better and better, obviously. Um, so if I see an applicant to where at multiple companies, like six companies and everywhere what they were like for a year, that's a no, right? I'm not gonna hire that person because, like, okay, they, they just want to jump or they just can't commit. And there may be reasons. So as I'm open, if it's like a few companies, you know, there can always be reason for that. You can talk about it in the interview. But if it's a clear pattern, it's an issue. Or in Germany, there's a six months. So if they have like three companies and they were there like five, six months, you know, that's always the end of the probation period. So everyone else probably didn't want to work with them. So there might be a reason if it's like the third or the fourth company. Um, so things like that, maybe as well a red flag, but they don't have happen that often. So it's not that we're looking okay. for them. For most people, when they're going through the hiring process, there's a question that pops up at the end, which is, do you have any questions for us? And 
my favorite one when I was hiring was always, where do you see the company in five years time and how can I build to that? I'm wondering what sort of questions could people ask you from within the data field that would impress you in that process? To be honest, honest question. So what we usually get is standard questions that they think that sound great if they ask them. So this is every time I ask a question, them. do you have, yeah, do you have any questions? It's mostly some standard phrases where they don't really care about the answer. It's mostly about like, mm -hmm. that sounds great if I ask that. It's like, that's not bad, right? So it's not like that's a minus, but it's like, ah, uh, you can just ask, you know, if you have an honest question, it's fine. So just use the time, right? Um, to ask your questions, that's it. And there's not the good questions that will impress the, the uh, impress me personally, like, I know that you probably Googled that one, right? If it sounds fancy, right? Um, so just be an honest person and ask something that you're actually interested in. And then it can be a good conversation. So things like, where's the company in five years? Where, I know, where can I be in five years? So things like that, you could ask, but we talk about it in the interview process anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's another question that's there. So the career is clear, the first month is clear, the onboarding is clear. Um, so that's, that would be typical questions that are just out of the question in our interview process because it's already discussed in detail before. But so I don't want to give really great tips here, but if you seem interested in the company, obviously that helps, right? So if you can do it in the very end. It doesn't take long to Google a company either before you go to an interview. Oh yeah, that's actually a big plus. That's true. Um, that's true. If if we always ask if they know what Scalefree is doing, right? That's a standard question, it's just like to see, you know, if they actually put some effort into the interview because already made it to the second interview, they come on site to do it here. And um, so I would expect that at least Google that us before and understand what we're doing. Um, if they don't have no idea at all what we're doing, that obviously would be a bad thing, right? So yes, that doesn't hurt to at least Google roughly what they're doing. <laughs> It helps. Have you ever had anybody walk into an interview that you've just got, you sat down, chatted with them and gone, no, this person is wrong. Like they don't fit the, the environment. They don't, personalities don't match. I, I mean, let's say on a positive. So, I mean, obviously I had both, right? I had people where I was in the interview process was like, okay, that, that person's perfect, right? Um, I still want to sleep on it, right? Because, you know, I never want to decide on this, let's say emotional faces where you like really like a person. Um, but that obviously happened a lot where it's just, it's a perfect fit. Um, but also obviously some people with, where you would know after like two minutes, it's not gonna work, right? Because uh, I talked about social skills as well. So there's a, if, if you don't have that at all, that's fine, obviously. And if you work internally, it doesn't matter. But as a consultant, it could be a big problem. So. Um, or they, they screw up the, the easiest question of them all and everything else, all the follow-up questions um, don't make sense anymore to ask. So we sit there like, okay, we can't really ask anything else. Um, so things like that happened as well. Um, but um, really, really rarely. And, you know, usually, you know, I'm not angry. It's like what it is, right? It's obviously not a fit. So mm -hmm. I'd still try to have a good interview experience. Um, often it's really young people who do it for the first time. So I want them to have a good feeling after or have a good experience and give them some feedback um, what they maybe could have done better, right? Um, so yes, it happened, but never like in a really negative way where I was like, okay, that person has to get out now or something like that. That never happened. That's why we have the first interview, yeah. right? So uh, Exactly. They don't make exactly. it Exactly. Um, how many steps are there in your interview process? I, I would say it's basically three steps. So the first one is the CV. So that's the CV check basically from the recruiting. So they have some a list of some basic skills, etc., language skills and some technical things. And they go through it. If they like it, um, they do a first interview on their own or with one consultant. That's just remotely like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, depends. Um, then they write down the feedback and then it goes the next decision round if they go to the on-site interview. And if so, they come to that one that takes an hour or a little bit longer. Um, and that's the ones that I did in the past, always nowadays, not um, all interviews anymore. Um, now the manager's doing that as well. 
Um, and after that one, we have the decision, right? Um, so that's it. So then it takes, we always say the Friday after and uh, the next week, then we have the decision and that's it. So it's a fairly, uh, let's say, nowadays I would say a small interview process, um, but it's definitely enough to find out if the person is a fit or not, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it sort of raises another question that we've had pop up in our news media here recently. Um, the use of chatbots and AI to go through CVs and and wheedle out applicants. There, there was a news story here this week about somebody who's applied for 100 jobs, um, highly qualified in their field, but the chatbot keeps flagging something so they don't get to go through. Is, is that an element of the process for you? Or is that something that you, you don't do for a specific reason? I don't want to do it unless it's a big efficiency problem, right? So mm -hmm. um, it's a really human process. So I would, you know, I love AI and I like to put it in multiple mm -hmm. um, areas at Scarefree and we do, right, in the back office processes, etc. cetera. Um, so it can help a lot. And um, so I think it makes sense to scan CVs and give some feedback on it, like a summary, but not making the decision. So far, we don't because, you know, we are a small company. It's still the number mm -hmm. of CVs is still easily, let's say easily, not maybe not really, but it's still manageable um, to go through as a person. So as long, that's fine. I would like to keep it that way. Um, if it's growing, growing, yes, I could make it easier, but only with recommendations. So I would never trust it to make a human decision for an applicant. Or I don't want to, let's say like that. Right. It's maybe good, but I, I, I don't want the machine to decide <laughs> these things. No, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Very fair. Um, I saw a slide today, actually, I think it was something from a IBM presentation. Machines aren't responsible. So well, machines can't take responsibility for decisions. So don't let machines make decisions. Yeah, basically true. Right. So that's that's a big, uh, it, it's a good phrase, right? A good sentence. Yes, I can. I, I will use one in the future. Um, maybe not everywhere, so easy decisions maybe can be done, but uh, especially in that regard, it's, uh, I think, a good thing that a human actually makes a decision. Mm. All right, last question for you then. Um, for someone who's looking at getting into the world of data engineering and becoming a data professional, what sort of advice would you give them? And is there any bad advice that you've heard along the way that you suggest they avoid? I mean, it depends where they are in their career, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. if they just, you know, if they're like 18 years old and they think about what they're going to do, um, if you don't work in the data industry, I would recommend to study uh, business um, informatics because it focuses on informatics, but also business, which is amazing if you want to work in the BI industry or work with data because you only, don't only learn how to extract data and load it, but also how to understand data, right? How to model it, et cetera. Um, so I think that's a really, really good fit where you have good experiences with. Um, then next to the studies, do something, learn some house doing your studies, right? So you can combine it already. So you remember it later, right? Just only wise, you will forget. Um, and then maybe start working in the third or fourth semester as a working student before you can have fun, right? So do that as well. It's important. Um, but then it can really help to get some work experience in that area. And um, that will make it really easy for you to start an industry. Because there's that, not that many people who are, you know, in that industry in the first place. And the second one, um, even less good ones. So if you really focus on your studies and do some, um, get some work early in the process, so you already learn some hows, if you finish your studies, you're going to have no problem finding a job, right? So. This is my my first. This is the first area. If you already know, mm -hmm. um, if you already did your studies in the back, and you want to come come in industry, and I would suggest to start with Udemy because always start with the whys. Learn about um, data like ETL processes, data warehousing, lake house, etc. Like what's out there, what is an architecture, and just basically how data flows, how data is modeled. Um, what tools are generally out there and what problems are they solving just to understand that first. And after you've got that one, um, start with technologies. And then it's much easier to understand what the technology is actually doing and you can learn the hows. and that's going to be your yeah, entrance in the, in the data industry. And um, that maybe takes 
I would say at least six months and then you could start working in the street, right? And there's great forums out there, right? You can come actually here with the <laughs> data innovators, right? It's, it's a mm. great forum, you can ask them, right? But obviously start with the really basics and then it, everything will make sense to you. And then you can ask qualified questions and you can have discussions and then it goes quickly. And I think then you can start like in six months where you can have a good start in the data industry, right? Um, so it's never too late. I think it's definitely one of the industries where you can always jump in if you're motivated and you have a lot of great learning um, tools out there like Udemy or, or I don't know how to pronounce it in English, is Udemy, I don't, I don't know. But this one, um, that's really good. Um, but also many other tools. So you find a lot, so you always have a chance to start a career there. Yes, and technology-wise, um, yes, there's some big ones out there, right? And the great stuff is it's like an oligopole, so it's only like three big vendors out there for cloud technologies, for the main ones behind it, right? Which AWS, you have Google, and obviously Microsoft. Um, so it's not that much. <laughs> and so you can learn some basics, what they're doing, and then you can learn some databases like Snowflake or Databricks, and then also some... Um, ETL tools like DBT or your CoreLess, et cetera, um, or Westscape, you know, there's a, a lot of great tools out there. And um, then you have a good setup. So don't learn like 10 databases or whatever. Try to learn a tool in every, every part of the architecture, right? And then you're going to have a real understanding of the whole thing, and then you can start your career. Brilliant. All right, one, one final question that's just popped into my head. Do yeah. you accept bribes? <laughs> No, of shout, course not. Shout to the interview with a chocolate bar or a coffee or something like that. <laughs> no, 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 never. <laughs> so far, no one offered, so I can't really give you an answer. <laughs> Damn. After yeah. somebody watches this and then puts in an application, you're bound to get something like that. I'm yeah, sure. I, I, then they start to send it by letter again, right? And then you open it and there's going to be some, you know, some ca hard cash in yeah. there. <laughs> something surprising Maybe. it's yeah. traditional and surprising yes. at the same time it's a great mix i have to say i've never yeah. heard of that so far so that's good i guess yeah i can't okay. say it happened often to me when i was hiring people but you never know it might happen one day somebody might yeah, show up maybe. with a chocolate bar and go here you go that's but, okay yeah that's yeah. good like man, man, easy bribing you know just just bring a cake mm. <laughs> yeah I, I used to run a movie theater years ago and we actually had one person show up to an interview uh, dressed up as Batman. And I'm just like, uh, like different. Absolutely. And um, what's the reason for the case? I love movies. I figured I might never get a chance to do this again, to actually go to a movie theater dressed as Batman to try and work it there. And he got the job. Like he, he actually did. He knew his movies and all the stuff. He was willing to learn um, and he was willing to do, to do things to stand out. And that was actually a really cool combination. So yeah, we, we ended up hiring Batman to come and work in a movie theater with us. I mean, it's tough for the story. You can always say, no, I hire Batman. That, that's yeah. a great story. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and he worked it he out to be that, a great employee right? as well. Now, he knew yeah. that you want that story. It's for the job you want. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Well, Chris, right. thank you very much for joining me. I have learned a mountain today, and I'm hoping that the listeners and viewers out there have done the same. Um, if people want to see whether or not you've got any jobs up or in, do you guys put them up on your website? Yeah, sure. Just go to scarefield.com. We have a career area, and there we have all the jobs listed. It's a really easy process online. You can just upload your stuff, send it. Um, we will reach out to you. We will always reach out to you. So promise you, we never ghost anyone. I know that happens a lot out there, but we don't do that. Um, so please reach out to us. Um, you have we have many many options. We talked here about all the data jobs. We also have jobs, uh, obviously in the back office marketing or in events, um, or HR from time to time. So just check it out. Um, we are a great company. <laughs> obviously, I say that, but. Yeah. I know. I'm. It's a great, it's a great company. I love it. You're you're allowed to be biased, and I've not heard any complaints from anybody within the company. I've only heard a very high praise from everyone I've spoken to. That's great. Brilliant. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, Paul. Then thank, thank you very much. much. Yes. See you next time. Bye bye.
Hey, I again want to thank Christoph for joining me this week. Absolutely fantastic to catch up with him whenever I get a chance. And I hope you got something really interesting out of it. It's always fascinating to see the hiring process from the perspective of the people who are doing the hiring, because it can be tough sometimes trying to break into an industry that you're passionate about. So there were some really fantastic tips and bits of advice there for everyone, which hopefully you can put into use. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, tell people about the video or podcast, let everyone know what's going on. And if you've got any comments or feedback, please feel free to drop them in the comments section below. Until next time, don't forget to go and check out the school classroom that we've got or sign up for the Data Pro newsletter. There's heaps of ways that you can keep yourself informed within the Data Pro field. And I will catch you guys all next time. Live long and prosper.